Okay, moving on to day 20 of the Assange hearing. I won't be doing as much switching back and forth between Murray and Gastola as I was last time, but I will be using both of their blogs again. And this is going more about the uh, prison conditions that we talked about in the last one. And Murray says, The prosecution's continued tactic of extraordinary aggression towards witnesses who are patently well-informed played less well, and there were distinct signs that Judge Bereitzer was becoming irritated by this approach. The totality of defense witnesses and the sheer extent of mutual corroboration they provided could not simply be dismissed by the prosecution attempting to characterize all of them as uninformed on a particular detail, still less as all acting in bad faith. To portray one witness as weak may appear justified if they can be shaken, but to attack a succession of patently well-qualified witnesses on no basis but aggression and unreasoning hostility becomes quickly unconvincing. So they're continuing to rely on affidavits from Gordon Cromberg and Allison Leukfeld. But remember, although every single one of the defense witnesses has said that Leukfeld and Kromberg are wrong as to fact, under U.S.-U.K. extradition agreements, the U.S. government witnesses may not be called and cross-examined. When the defense witnesses are attacked so strongly in cross-examination on the points of disagreement with Kromberg and Leukfeld, it becomes glaringly wrong that Kromberg and Leukfeld may not be similarly cross-examined by the defense on the same points. Yeah, that is completely bogus. So, All right, get with the first witness, Maureen Baird. She confirmed that she anticipated Assange would be subject to special administrative measures pre-trial based on the national security agreement and all the documentation submitted by the U.S. attorneys and post-trial. Fitzgerald quoted Kronberg as stating that a prisoner could appeal to the case manager and unit manager against the conditions of Sam's. Baird replied that those people could do nothing. Sam's was way above their pay grade. Kronberg's description was unrealistic, as was his description of judicial review. All internal procedures would have to be exhausted first, which would take many years and go nowhere. She had never seen any case of Sam's being changed. Similarly, when Fitzgerald put to her that Sam's were imposed for only a year at a time and subject to annual review, Baird replied that she had never heard of any case of their not being renewed. They appeared simply to be rolled over by the AG's office. And Murray writes, It was interesting to see how the prosecution would claim that Baird was unqualified. It was very difficult to counter the evidence of a prison warden about the inhumanity of the prison regime. The U.S. government hit on a quite extraordinary attack. They claimed that the prison system was generally pleasant, as described by Leukfeld and Kromberg, but that the prisons in which Baird had worked had indeed been bad, but only because Baird was a bad warden. And so Dobbin cross-examining says, and again, this isn't an exact transcript because Marie's not allowed to take an exact transcript because we're not even pretending at this point. Why do you say it is likely Assange will get Sam's? Kromberg only says it's possible. Kromberg talks about it a very great deal. It is very plainly on the table. Dobbin, it is speculative. It can only be decided by the AG as reasonably necessary to prevent the disclosure of national security information. Baird, they have made plain they believe Assange to hold further such information. You are not in any position to make any judgment. Baird, it is my opinion he would be judged to meet that criterion based on their past decisions. Dobbin, how can you say the risk exists he would disclose national security information? Baird, he is charged with espionage. They have said he is a continuing risk. Dobbin, I am suggesting that is highly speculative and you cannot know. Baird, I am judging by what the government have said and the fact that they have so much emphasized Sam's. They very definitely fail to say in all this that Sam's will not be applied. And Marie says, In over two hours of cross-examination, Dobbin again and again tried to discredit Baird's testimony by contrasting it with the evidence of Kromberg and Leukfeld, but this was entirely counterproductive for Dobbin. It served instead to illustrate how very far Kromberg and Leukfeld's assurances were from the description of what really happens from an experienced prison warden. And so the afternoon witness is Lindsay Lewis. I'm going to pop over to Gastola for this. And she was a lawyer for a guy named Abu Hamza. 
He was extradited to the United States from the UK in 2012. His extradition was permitted by the European Court of Human Rights and the British courts because the US government assured them that Mustafa would not be confined at a supermax prison in Florence, Colorado for a lengthy indefinite period. Yet, for the last five years, Mustafa has been housed at ADX Florence in solitary confinement and subject to special administrative measures. Mustafa's attorney, Lindsay Lewis, maintains the U.S. government misled the courts in order to make it seem like he would not be subject to cruel and inhuman treatment if extradited. In other words, the U.S. government has a history of telling bald, open-faced lies in court saying that someone will not be subjected to these conditions when they absolutely are. Now, Mustafa is severely disabled. He's a double upper arm amputee, blind in one eye, and suffers from diabetes, hypertension, and a skin condition known as hyperhidrosis. Now, I don't know about the rest, but the first two is a result of him fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan. But yeah, this guy needs a lot of care, so... In 2007, Judge Tim Workman of the Westminster Magistrates Court, the same court reviewing the extradition request for Assange, ruled in favor of Mustafa's extradition. Workman indicated, ADX Florence could, if applied for a lengthy indefinite period, result in inhuman and degrading treatment that violated Article 3 of the Convention Against Torture. But Ron Wiley, who was the warden at ADX Florence, told the court it was highly unlikely for someone like Mustafa with type 2 diabetes, raised blood pressure, psoriasis, loss of sight in one eye, and bilateral amputation of both forearms, who required assistance for the activities of daily living, to be placed at ADX Florence. As Lewis noted during her testimony, Wiley stated, If it is determined that Mr. Mustafa cannot manage his activities of daily living, it is highly unlikely that he would be placed at the ADX, but rather at a medical center. That led the judge to declare, I am satisfied that the defendant would not be detained in these conditions, in other words, ADX, indefinitely, that his undoubted ill health and physical disabilities would be considered, and at worst, he would only be accommodated in ADX for a relatively short period of time. Whilst I find these conditions offensive to my sense of propriety in dealing with prisoners, I cannot conclude that, in the short term, the incarceration in a supermax prison would be incompatible with his Article 3 rights. But again, he's been there for the last five years. And Lewis points out it was asserted by the FCO that he would not be put in solitary confinement because he would need to receive care for his disabilities. Any time he spent at ADX Florence would be relatively short until a medical evaluation was completed. Then he would be transferred to a medical center. The ECHR accepted these assurances and rejected Mustafa's appeal. So Claire Dobbin cross-examined, and she argued multiple times that the U.S. government never represented that Mustafa would not be sent to ADX Florence, when that was the whole reason they allowed the extradition to happen. So Lewis rejected this argument and criticized the rubber stamp process that has kept Mustafa at ADX and lacked transparency. Lewis compared the medical care Mustafa received in the United Kingdom to the treatment he has received in the United States. For example, Mustafa used to receive daily nursing care four to six times a day, which does not happen at ADX Florence. And popping back over to Murray, Murray writes, The one thing which struck me most was Lewis's description of the incident that was used to justify the continued imposition of Sam's on Hamza. Hamza is allowed to communicate only with two named family members, one of whom is one of his sons. In a letter, Hamza had asked this son to tell his one-year-old grandchild that he loved him. Hamza was charged with an illegal message to a third party, the one-year-old grandson. This had resulted in an extension of the Sam's regime on Hamza, which still continues. In cross-examination, Dobbin was at pains to suggest this I love you may have been a coded terrorist message. A coded terrorist message to a one-year-old. Give me a break. And Murray writes, 
The day concluded with a foretaste of excitement to come as Judge Bereitzer agreed to grant witness anonymity to the two UC Global whistleblowers who were to give evidence on UC Global spying on Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy. Ha <laughs> ha! This is what a lot of us have been wanting to know about. When they spied on Assange, apparently at the behest of the CIA, and broke all sorts of laws in the process, so... In making application, Summers gave notice that among the topics to be discussed was the instruction from UC Global's American clients to consider poisoning or kidnapping Assange. The hidden firearm with filed-off serial numbers discovered in the home of UC Global's chief executive David Morales and his relationship to the head of security at the Las Vegas Sands Complex were also briefly mooted. That is one part of this I'm really looking forward to. I mean, the things that are coming out in this trial, they deserve to be spread around everywhere, so please do so. Please like and subscribe. Share this video or audio file or whatever you got everywhere. If you're on YouTube, please leave a comment, because apparently that feeds the algorithm and gets this higher up in the results so more people can see it. And above all, if you like what I'm doing, please go to donate.bogosity.tv. You can become a regular supporter at Patreon and Subscribestar and get these reports and all my videos early and ad-free. Or you can just give me a one-time donation at PayPal. Or if you have crypto, just send me a few pennies if that's all you can afford. Every little bit helps. So thank you very much. Hopefully you'll stick around for the next ones because it sounds like it's going to get really interesting. Until then, stay strong and be free.